All right, guys, welcome back to the MVM Show. I'm Titus, your host, and I'm here with a special guest today. I think you guys are going to enjoy it. Yeah, before I go any further, um, I'm, I'm kind of laughing because I did a podcast episode um, a, a couple episodes ago and br- told you guys that there was a secret weapon and uh, that I'd be showing you guys, and I think that was two or three episodes ago. And here today I have the owner and uh, creator of that secret weapon, the flashback to the Duck Creek Decoy Works owner on Tyler out of Colorado. How you doing, Tyler? Hey, really appreciate you guys having me on. Those are flattering words about uh, the flashback. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so that that being said, for those of you that messaged me on Instagram and gave me the shh, sign (laughs) kind of shows how it works and how good it works they were basically saying hey don't be saying nothing but um that's i I get it you know us duck hunters we kind of like to be on the cutting edge of stuff and using stuff no one else uses and i i totally get that trust me but anyways um tyler why don't you uh tell us just kind of some of your background and your history and how you got into duck hunting and all that yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. But uh, your earlier mention of uh, the, the shush symbol is uh, just uh, to allude to it here is uh, one of the issues that we face from a marketing standpoint is uh, nobody likes giving up their secrets. Yep. But uh, uh, yeah, so I started, I grew up in uh, Minnesota, right outside of the cities, the mm. uh, little town called Sunfish Lake, Minnesota. Um the mean streets of sunfish lake i guess you can say (laughs) um anyway uh so you know a couple generations before me so my grandfather purchased um a a little plot of land on a lake a natural environment lake up in central or northern minnesota depending upon how you look at it and uh he was a big duck hunter, and uh, it was kind of a family tradition to go up to this duck camp in central Minnesota and uh, hunt with the guys. Uh, you know, I had a great uncle that was a Monsignor in the Catholic Church, and uh, it was kind of a spiritual thing to go up there and hunt. Uh, that Monsignor would say mass on the shores of the lake there for all the duck hunters after they were done duck hunting. and. Uh, uh, you know, fortunately for me, I got uh, roped into this kind of great tradition of duck hunting uh, on the big water in, in central Minnesota. Um, you know, my dad was an executive uh, with Northwest Airlines and uh, yeah. didn't have a ton of time all the time to see us as kids. But, uh, you know, it was the, before the days of cell phones and everything else. Mm, we, yeah. used to, we used to sneak up there and, and, uh, he would uh, kind of take us out duck hunting. He, he wasn't like a super passionate duck hunter. In fact, he's the kind of guy that you'd catch sleeping in the blind or sleeping <laughs> in the boat. Uh-huh. Um, but he wanted to make sure that my brother and I were introduced to hunting and fishing. And, uh, uh, you know, we just kind of took it from there. Um, but uh, I was crazed about it since day one and uh, never looked back. That's awesome. Yeah, on your website, seeing some of your pictures. So your last name is, do I pronounce this right, Baskfield? Correct, Baskfield. Okay, what's the, what's the background of that, that name? Is that? So we're, my, my mom is 100% German from St. Cloud, Minnesota. Oh, okay. Um, I've been to St. Cloud. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, kind of known for uh, St. Cloud State hockey and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, so she was 100% German, and um, uh, her last name is Moeller. But uh, my so the, the family lore is that uh, my dad's Irish side of the family, when they immigrated, uh, had to change their name for some reason to an English sounding name in order to get uh, get into the States. I don't mm-hmm. know if they were horse horse thieves in Ireland or what the <laughs> hell happened over there. But uh, um, yeah, so uh, it's an English sounding name, but we're uh, half German, half Irish. OK, 100 percent on both sides, huh? Yeah. Oh wow. Uh, motivated motivated drinkers, I guess you could say. <laughs> well, that's that's so yeah, I was kind of looking over your your uh, website and stuff. A really nice website. Guys, you can check it out duckcreekdecoys.com and and before we get too deep into this conversation, Tyler, where else can they find you if people want to look you up? 
Yeah, flashbackdecoys.com. You can find us on Instagram and uh, Facebook. And um, yeah, uh, you know, all you got to do is Google search flashback decoys and we'll pop up. Okay, now I'm on duckcreekdecoys.com. Is that, is both those sites work? Because you said flashbackdecoys.com. Are you just. uh, Both, both will go take you to our site. Oh, gotcha. Okay, cool. Well, um, We'll get into some more personal maybe stories and stuff later, but I'd really like to hear um, what started Duck Creek Decoy Works. Like, how'd that originate and how long has it been going for? Yeah, so we've been up and running for five years. Um, So let's take a step back here. So, uh, you know, because of that kind of family duck camp that we had, uh, when I was growing up, I thought it was super critical for every family to try to have access to a place where they could get together, kind of tune off the uh, turn off the outside world and circle the wagons together, um, because that's what my family used it for. And so, uh, you know, I was working for the Colorado Division of Wildlife at the time, and I bought this little farm north of Denver here. Um, you know, um, you're not going to see it on Architectural Digest anytime soon, but uh, we have some acreage and a wetland on it, and, and uh, the South Platte River runs through it. Oh, wow. And, uh, so I bought that before I even got married or, or bought a house or anything like that, just because I wanted to kind of tie that up before uh, before other people were just decided to jump into the decision-making yeah. process, yeah. so to speak. So, so I bought that farm, and... Uh, you know, there's this little wetland on it, and the farm is an in-holding and a huge landowner's farm, yeah. uh, Magnus Land and Cattle, and they don't allow hunting on their place. And it's a they have just a beautiful farm up there, and they run cattle on it, but they don't allow hunting on their place, and, and they've got some great sloughs and stuff. But essentially what that makes me is surrounded by, you know, complete sanctuary, right, where, where ducks don't uh, get shot at at all. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was facing this problem with my wetland with these late season mallards where, you know, they'd fly over at a couple of yards to the next slough that was on Magnus's place. And I could not trick them. I mm. could, uh, I, I could call at them. I could use, you know, 200 decoys. I could, I could, I could not figure out how to trick them. And, uh, you know, one day I had an epiphany. If I, if I could get some action on the smaller wetland, mm-hmm. you know, all the, all the sloughs out here are, are, are pretty minute. They're, they're small. So your decoys don't move unless the wind's blowing 40 miles an hour. And I, th- I thought that was the, the, the issue that I was facing. And, you know, I'm not a guy who enjoys hunting over a jerk string. I think there's just too much going on. Uh, I enjoy hunting by myself an awful lot. So I didn't like, uh, doing the puppet show with the jerk string and, the uh, calls and the whole nine yards um so you know i just kind of had this epiphany if i could make a motion decoy that actually looked like a feeding duck and not like a water feature and something that i didn't have to fight with all the time that was breaking mm-hmm. down on me all the time uh, maybe i could trick these things so um you know i started working with some styrofoam and actually my bathtub and uh kind of figured out this uh this motion and uh you know went with it from there so uh started working with some engineers to put this motion together and and put a decoy together and that was kind of a painful process and started bootstrapping strapping the process myself but finally got a couple prototypes uh i took those all over the state kind of watching how ducks reacted to them looking at what we could do better looking how we can make it more durable and uh finally kind of came to the conclusion that uh the flashback was the way to go so um yeah uh from that point uh put a video up on youtube of uh one of the prototypes and people went nuts for it so um you know i was working at the division of wildlife and uh didn't really want to do the 30 year state employee life sentence there so Mm. just kind of you know uh got it down and made the jump and here we are wow that's i i i wondered that process of like when you kind of create something i mean you just gotta like did you have to like draw it out on a diagram to get that rolling and like how do you just go about getting i mean i'm not trying to ask for secrets or for like how you did Uh exactly what you did but i mean like how do you get a hold of people 
to get those parts or have things custom made like that for you. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, it started with honestly just some sheets of styrofoam and, uh, you know, some, some long screws and bolts and that kind of thing. And we would kind of mess with the weight of it until you got that action that where you could get the weight in the head that just kind of b- pulled up the butt end of it. But, uh, you know, fortunately we live in a time where like 3d printing is so mm-hmm. popular. Um, you know, you can have some engineers some people smarter than me dr- draw up some parts and, uh, figure some things out for you um, and uh, slowly you kind of whittle it down into something that's eloquent easy to work with and actually looks like a real duck um, mm. but yeah it's kind of a painful process I mean you, you spend a lot of time on going down paths that don't uh, really work out for you and you got to start over again scrap it and, and take another look at it um, you know there are days where this thing is 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 so you know, it's like working with like, uh, something from NASA, you know, it's like, uh, if you get a couple ounces wrong here or a couple ounces wrong on the front end or the back end, all of a sudden that action that, that, uh, that produces those ripples and that flash kind of goes away. So it was a struggle for sure. There were days where, uh, my wife was like, what have we done here? And I'm like, you know, we got to just hang through and, and follow it all the way through and we'll get this right. So, yeah. um, we're pretty proud of it. And, uh, you know, I think uh, the reaction from the duck hunters out there kind of speaks for itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's one of those things that definitely will speak for itself. And any time, uh, any type of motion um, is just so key, especially on those those calm, windless days. And I think even, and I'm curious to see <clears throat> how it plays out this season using those. Is even when it is windy, um, like I feel like this that your product still would be pretty great, pretty good to have even on a choppy wind day because just the fact of maybe it's not going to make ripples so much because there's so much wind or ripples on the water from the wind, but the fact that that movement that is lifelike, you know, just dipping the head in. And so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm kind of excited about that part of it too, honestly. We have a ton of customers in like the upper Midwest, like the Great Lakes region of the country that uh, use them on divers and they'll, mm. you know, they'll uh, put them in their gang rigs and that kind of thing. Just because you get that strobe effect mm. where, you know, decoy, the, the standard kind of traditional decoy isn't flipping around like that. So, uh, yeah, we've got a ton of guys that use them and figure out how to use them with their gang rigs and uh, swear by them on divers on some of the big water up there. Now, I seen something on your Instagram page, um, I believe, that there's another way that you can do it. There, you almost got two options on that, on one rig, and that is if you wrap the cord around something, you could keep it where it's just the butt up and it's it's wiggling back and forth, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's the other thing. So, you know, as hunters, we always want options, right? And we always kind of kind of try to perfect that uh, decoy rig when it's out there or that spread when it's out there so we uh, our decoy the flashback provides two actions and uh, it's pretty simple to change from one to the other so there's kind of the standard dabbling action that uh, the butt end of this thing comes straight up and it kind of hovers there for a second or two and then plops back down and that creates some nice ripples but uh, if you really want to move some water and uh, you want a little bit more strobe effect uh, you take that cord and wrap it through, and that prevents the head from going all the way around. And then, there, therefore, the head just kind of acts like a paddle, and that butt end of the decoy really pushes some water around, and will push your other decoys, your traditional decoys, around. A lot of guys uh, swear by that, but uh, you know we've got guys who use uh, more than ten of these in a rig, wow. and uh, um, they'll they'll do half and half, or uh, you know they they get to kind of they get to kind of set up their rig the way they want to. Yeah. And I think uh, the other thing that's pretty cool about that, and, you know, as hunters, we kind of grew up, I don't know how old you are, Titus. I'm assuming you're younger than I am because I'm kind of an antique. But uh, <laughs> I'm 39. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So so I'm 50 years old. But, uh, you know, we always grew up with the kind of philosophy that m- more was more. Mm-hmm. And uh, if 100 decoys is working well, 200 decoys is going to work better. But, uh For our customers, I try to encourage them to, especially late season, just go out with a couple pairs or even a pair of these and a couple other standard traditional decoys 
And, uh, you know, it always helps if you can be close to the X, but uh, it's so different to just run a small setup like that and kind of refreshing not to have to carry in, uh, uh, you know, a hundred decoys and set up a hundred mm-hmm. decoys. Uh, it can be, it can be kind of hyper effective to just sit there with a couple pairs and uh, uh, watch the ducks work. Yeah. No, I, I say that a lot on our videos and, and our podcasts about, uh, you know, someone was asking me, how do you feel about a pair of de- decoys or two pairs of decoys on a late season hunt? And I'm like, I do it all the time. I, I do it all the time and, and kill birds. And a lot of times even just take that a step farther because sometimes we'll hunt in some tight stuff with the toolies and, you know, little pockets. Yeah. I will not put the decoys in the hole that I want to kill them in because in the later season birds, I'm more so speaking for mallards. They don't really necessarily want to be in the same pocket with another pair. They kind of want to be in their own little pocket. So I know that sounds kind of foreign to a lot of people, but I've killed a lot of birds doing that. Um, It feels kind of wrong too. Like, okay, I'm in this pocket, but I'm going to put a pair in this pocket next to me and a pair in that other pocket next to me. And sure enough, they'll come right in. And I think even if you're just to use one of these in a spot where you want the birds to come, um, well, I guess we'll just let the the season show out for us this year in some of the videos that we'll put out. Yeah, but I would encourage customers especially to just try it. Um, it you're right. It does feel wrong, right? Like we've been told that we got to you know start setting out decoys at four in the morning and put out a gigantic spread but uh you know on the south plat where i hunt here everybody has a ton of full body decoys on the river and a ton of swimmers on the river and uh you know the standard decoys and i think that uh these mallards that are getting kind of super educated uh if you put out a small spread they're not used to seeing it and it, and uh you add realism to that spread I think it uh, really increases the effectiveness of it. Hundred mm-hmm. percent. And <clears throat> kind of to go back to that, you know, I I respect my listeners and I I bring them up quite a bit and <clears throat> answer a lot of questions they have and I respect the the waterfowl um, us waterfowlers as a whole because I think get you know give respect you'll get respect and i feel like i do have that for the most part and so i'm not trying to step on anybody's toes for putting out something like a secret you know something like this because i believe this is gonna grow a lot bigger than it probably already is as far as your company goes but i don't really think it's fair either and i don't think no one else thinks this either that it's not fair to someone like yourself that has a business to not share it every once in a while. doesn't mean I got to make a huge deal about it all the time, but I think it's only fair for someone, a fellow waterfowler, a fellow blue collar person trying to run a business to bring this out. So kind of just wanted to say that to the listeners, you know, well, I appreciate that. And, you know, my philosophy from running a company standpoint and, you know, you know, I'm not super great at chest beating or, or bragging about myself, but, uh, you know, my philosophy has always been is if we manufacture these correctly and we provide good customer service, the rest will take care of itself. Mm. And you had kind words about my website, but between you and I, you know, my website's a little clunky and, uh, you know, we're not, uh, on top of everything when it comes to social media all the time. Um, but, uh, that stuff's going to come around on its own as, 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 uh, our, uh, uh, flashback gets more and more popular and uh, I can hire on some more people, provide some more jobs and uh, get this thing cranked up. But, uh, um, you know, duck hunting is an arms race and uh, uh, everybody's looking for the latest, greatest. And uh, if you're not part of that arms race, um, you know, uh, people are going to pass you up and that that's not necessarily a bad thing. I, th- I you know, I've got a ton of respect for people who, hunt from a traditional standpoint too mm-hmm. with wooden decoys and everything else but uh at the same time um there's something to be said for being successful when you only have a few coveted days in the field with your family or friends a year too so yeah yeah 100 percent. i totally agree with you on that <clears throat> so i'm just more questions that i'm sure you get asked a lot and just so help the listeners too what's the battery life like on one of these so 
um, we say nine to 12 hours battery life. We've got a uh, lithium battery that uh, we use on it. And uh, we went from a sealed lead acid to a lithium just uh, because of the weight involved. Um, yeah. But it, it's going to depend on conditions and temperature and that kind of stuff too. Uh, I would say the the least you're going to get out of it, um, as long as you have a relatively new battery that you bought in the last couple of years, is, is nine hours. But uh, we can get up to 12 hours on it, and uh, you know it charges up pretty quick. So we think we have a slick rig, but uh, we're always looking to improve. And God, if one of your listeners knows and has an idea where I can get a lithium battery that's made here in the United States with a little bit more quality to it, uh, I would jump at the opportunity to do that. But mm. uh, we haven't been able to do that and uh, without really gouging our customers on that front. So gotcha. um, it's a fine line on that front. But, uh, you know, we sell replacement batteries and, and lithium batteries don't really do well with moisture. So you got to be careful when you're when you're uh, setting these things up to go out. I always recommend that people, you know, kind of set them up the night before and uh, get them all set ready to go. So you're not fighting with them in the dark, uh, on a snowy or rainy day. Well, that being said, let me ask you, because I was messing with them a couple of weeks ago. I got them all charged, like fully charged and was testing them out in the water and stuff. And um, what is your, there's, let's see here, there's one, two, two connection points, right? You could do it two different ways. One, you could, <clears throat> excuse me, you could plug it into the battery box where the battery's already plugged in to the cable that comes out. Or you could do it vice versa, right? What's like what's the best way that you preset yours up for the next day? So here's how I do it, and I'm looking to put out a video on this this front because we get this cu- this question from a ton of customers. Um, so there's one connector, and that essentially adds as acts as the on off switch. But you're right; you can also turn it on and off by plugging the battery in in the dry box also. But I've got uh, like a six slot decoy bag, just kind of your standard uh, six slot decoy bag, full body mallard decoy bag. And uh, what I do the night before is I uh, connect the batteries to the um, port in the in the dry box, mm. and then I run the cord and kind of half connect. If it makes any sense, it's tough to articulate. Because uh, the way it screws in, sound. right? Yep, yep. Yep. So you just put it, you, you stick it in there until uh, it turns on and then kind of pull it out a little mm, bit. Yeah. And then uh, when you get there in the morning, when you get to your spot where you're going to deploy these things, you put them out, uh, you smash that together and, and screw that cap down. That makes sense. And that's the easiest way to handle that, especially with cold fingers and, uh, you know, snowy conditions. Okay. That makes complete sense. That, that's a great, I, I didn't even think about that because you got to, it's, it threads on several times anyway, so it seems like that's, yeah. that would be the best option. Yeah, the connector is a serious connector, so uh, if you just kind of half-ass plug it in a little bit, and then uh, when you get there in the morning and you're ready to set these things out, screw it all the way down, it turns on, and you can kind of throw them out just like a normal decoy. Mm, well, that makes sense. Okay, I appreciate that. Another thing that I wanted to mention, um, I was really, really impressed uh, how quiet that I felt like the flashback to was because just to just to be honest with you here, I had never seen the one, but my brother did, and he was like, he know he doesn't worry about sound as much as I do, but I always say this all the time: ducks can hear, ducks can hear, and people laugh at me. And it's like, well, they can. Like I hear, I'll be out hunting, trying to be quiet and hidden. And you hear guys joking and laughing three, four hundred yards away, and I'm like, "How do you guys think you're gonna kill ducks?" So, that being said, we've used a lot of different things for motion pulsators, ripplers, just all this different kind of stuff, and they all kind of have noise to a point. But my brother's all, oh, it's, you, "I think it kind of makes some noise. You're gonna, you're not gonna like it." Well, he had never heard the pulsate. Or, I'm sorry, the um, flashback too. Is that a noticeable difference to you? Because I never heard the one, so I'm just going off of what he said because I couldn't hear anything on the flashback too. Like they're, it's pretty quiet. Yeah, and uh, so you know we put a lot of thought into this. So we had a motor that we were using before that was a little bit louder, and uh, you know 
it's strange, right? Because as duck hunters, our hearing's probably not the best to begin with. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. at least from my generation, uh-huh. uh, before uh, hearing protection was really pushed. But uh, uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a tough time hearing in a crowded restaurant. But uh, I do think that noise plays a role in, in it, especially on a calm, calm day. Uh-huh. But uh, we went to a quieter motor for that reason, and uh, you know, we've been pretty excited about the success of that 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 motor. I can hear it when I'm approaching the decoy, uh, you know, from maybe five or 10 yards away. But uh, my theory has always been if you're not pulling the trigger on a duck that has uh, has its feet down 10 yards over the decoy, you got other issues to worry right. about besides the, the sound of your decoys. Right. At that point. Yeah. So, so we're pleased with the progress we made on that front. And, you know, you do get a little bit of a clicking sound. So, so, uh, you know, we use new neodyne magnets to do this in a way where we're not burning out motors and s- stripping shafts and that kind of thing. It's kind of a really cool way that we do it. So you can get this thing tangled in a, in a clump of weeds or whatever, and actually it's going to continue to kind of have a random motion that makes it almost seem more alive. But you are going to get a little bit of a clicking sound of those magnets kind of sliding by each other, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And uh, I... You know, I've spent countless hours staring at this thing in wetlands, and uh, I don't see the ducks flaring from it. I yeah. just don't. Um, and, you know, I would love to go down to a timber hole and check it out. I would love to go to some of the other areas, but I don't hear it from my customers either. You know, uh, we've got a phenomenal, phenomenal rate of no return on these. And, you know, I think in our five years, I think we had one customer send them back because of noise. Hmm. But you do get a little bit of a clicking sound and it uh, doesn't seem to bother the ducks where I hunt at all. So, hmm. Yeah, I like I said, I mean, I'm very, very skeptical. And yes, my hearing isn't that good. But like you said, if you're if you're five yards away and you can't hear it, uh, it's game over for the ducks. I mean, that's just right. just common sense, right? And that dabbling motion is so quiet. Oh. You know, it's the only it's the only the the surface feeding motion, as I call it, where that cord is is forcing that head to stop, and you get a little bit of a click, click, mm-hmm. click. But again, twenty yards away from that, you're not going to hear it. And uh, if the wind is blowing at all, you're definitely not going to hear right. it any further away from that. So, so. Uh, <laughs> I haven't seen any issues with it, and if there were issues with it, uh, trust me, I'd be all over it. Right. So. You'd be the first guy. <laughs> well, like I said, I, I had it in my pool. Um, I ha- It was no wind. It's in my backyard. It's totally surrounded, and I couldn't hear a thing. So, I mean, like yeah, you said. Yeah, I got to ask, when, when you had it in your pool, did any mallards land next to it? Hey, believe it or not, <laughs> there's a canal behind my house. And I have had mallards lock up while I'm in my backyard, so I was waiting. I was looking around, see, <laughs> see if anything would come in, but uh, not yet. We'll see. Yeah. Maybe, maybe closer to duck season. So, <clears throat> is there? Do you guys have like a warranty or anything? I mean, you obviously not have no issues because people aren't sending them back. But kind of, what's your coverage look like? Yeah, you know, uh, so. You know, we, we, we have a kind of an expensive price. Our retail price is high, and I know that. So, um, you know, what I say to people is we've got a standard 30-day warranty on it. Um, but uh, if there are issues uh, and you give us a call, we're usually pretty good about working things out with people. Um, I, want them, I want people to know that uh, we know here that uh, they're expensive decoys, but mm-hmm. uh, that's kind of part of the price that you pay, too, for having something made in the United States and something that's not uh, a water feature or an RC car motor and, and made overseas. So, um, you know, I thought that there's a certain kind of clientele out there that uh, wants a decoy that they don't want to have to fight with on a cold day, mm-hmm. and uh, um, they support uh, putting people to work here in Denver and, 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 uh, support us. We've only heard good things from, uh, our customers on that front. So that's awesome. That's awesome. Um, how, how does it do, like, what's the most shallow water you can use that in the, I mean, I'm just asking questions. I know people are going to be asking, so hopefully I can get them most of them. Yeah, so, here. so that's kind of, it's, it's kind of cool. So, you, you know, we talked about that surface feeding motion. Uh-huh. Uh, you can run that in four inches of water um, and just wow. let the ground or the bottom of the wetland stop the head. 
and still get those that ripple effect huh. or uh, you know i've seen video a lot of our customers kind of just digging out a little hole if they want that uh that dabbling motion too but nine inches for the dabbling motion and about four inches for that uh for that uh surface feeding motion you know we've got a lot of guys like in arkansas and stuff that hunt rice that's just barely flooded and uh they swear by it so uh and it's not uh, bad for the motor huh for that to not be able to spin all the way around no and i think that's where like we really excel is because we use neodyne magnets and, and you can picture this it's a it's a rotor in a waterproof compartment that turns uh uh, or a motor in a ro- in a waterproof compartment that turns a rotor with three neodyne magnets on it, mm-hmm. and then there's a head that uh, kind of wraps around the motor with another three neodyne magnets. So, so essentially, the magnets are pushing the magnets. So, if you run into fishing line or weeds or whatever the case may be, all this thing is going to do is clutch and keep right on going. Mm. So you're not going to overheat your motor or burn out your motor or strip shafts or anything like that. Um, so, you know, for guys who hunt super vegetated areas and, uh, uh, shallow areas, it's, it's a great motion decoy. That's awesome. That's, that's killer right there. Cause that's a big holdup on a lot of products I've used is water depth and we'll hunt a lot of stuff that's pretty shallow. That's yeah. Awesome. And you know, I don't know if you guys are seeing it there in California, but we're seeing a lot more of this kind of, I don't know if it's an invasive species of algae or what, what it may be, but, uh, um, this kind of skin algae that's like almost gelatinous that's on top of wetlands. We get, we get it a lot out here, especially early season after like the first freeze, it kind of goes away, but, uh, um, you can still run this stuff in a, in a algae filled wetland and, and not have any issues with it. It may just kick into that surface feeding motion, but you're still going to get great ripples and great, uh, flash from it. So, yeah. Now, like say when you get done with the hunt and you're hunting something highly vegetated, vegetative or something like that where you said it's like a gelatinous like um uh algae or whatever do you take those home and just spray them off or like how do you, do you kind of got to get in there and clean them and take them apart a little bit or is it just it's fine yeah i just spray them off i just spray them off or uh you know i mean time is kind of a net, uh, a big resource for me so if you clear a little bit of water in the wetland and just kind of shake them back and forth uh anything that's in there kind of falls out and it's working again but uh you know you bring up a good point uh a lot we get the question a lot can we use them in salt water and yes you can salt and brackish water is just fine i just recommend that people uh uh you know kind of treat it the same way they would with any other piece of sporting equipment when they're using them in salt water where they come home and kind of just wash it off. But, uh, all the, all the hardware is stainless steel, it's ABS plastic and foam and that motor's in a waterproof compartment. So, you know, uh, salt water isn't going to affect it. And, uh, uh, you know, the worst that might happen is like, uh, self plat out here has a lot of little kind of fine sand and gravel and you may get a couple pieces stuck in the head or whatever. And usually if you give it a good shake, you're right back to hunting. So, so that, I mean, they're pretty tough then, really. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point, right? Like, yeah. uh, you know, spinning wings kind of changed the way people hunted. But, uh, you know, I've, ha- I've been on a lot of hunts where we used to use spinning wings where, you know, you spend a good amount of time fighting with those things. And um, they're not the most eloquent thing to hunt over if they're clanking around or whatever the case may be or I don't know. Um, I wanted something that you just, like I said, you get so few days in the field. I feel like that the last thing you want to do is be fighting with equipment. And, Mm -hmm. you know, we spend thousands of dollars on calls and guns and trips and outfitters and everything else. Like you got to have something that you can depend on. Otherwise, uh, you know, it can turn a hunt from a good time to a real crappy time really quick. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. But before we get into some, some more, maybe some duck hunting stories or talk, whatever, is there anything else that you could bring up that maybe the listeners would like to hear or help them out about the product? When it comes, yeah. So when it comes to questions about the flashback, uh, I think the other big thing that we really like about uh, the design of this is, uh, you know, accidents happen in the field, you know, things fall off trucks and people shoot stuff and uh 
different hunters treat their equipment differently. So we came up with uh, a design here that allows for replacement parts. And I think that's huge. And these, it's an intuitive design. So essentially by removing one nut, one lock nut, uh, you can replace any of the parts, any of the three parts or four parts, I guess. So you've got a battery box, you've got a body, you've got a head and you've got a waterproof motor. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can replace any of those parts just by hopping on our website and buying a new one. So if your buddy runs a truck over your decoy bag mm-hmm. and uh, uh, you're out a bunch of decoys, instead of throwing them in the dumpster, you know, you can just replace uh, maybe a body here or whatever the case may be. So I think that's uh, kind of an industry first. And, uh, you know, back in the, the days of the, the spinning wings and stuff, I felt like, uh, you know, you were lucky if you threw that thing in the dumpster at the end of the season, but you were throwing it in the dumpster at the end of the season. Yeah. And then you were one. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just from a sustainability standpoint, I hate throwing stuff in the dumpster. So, you know, if guys beat up the body on it and the paint jobs chipped and everything else, you can just buy a body and, and replace it for the next season and start back up again. So we're really proud of that. Yeah. And I believe you just recently did a video on your uh, Instagram on how to do that, that quick change out of parts or change things, right? Yep. Super we did, simple. We did. Yeah, and it takes less than a minute to take the thing yeah. apart. So, yeah. um, I think anybody can do it, and uh, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to send the decoy back in and go through that rigmarole. So, um, we're pretty proud of that. I think that's uh, kind of a new, new era in the motion decoy business. That's a big deal. It is, because I mean, I know me, especially during duck season, if something goes south or breaks or whatever, or like you said, it falls out of your truck or someone runs over it. I mean. You're like, oh, here we go. You know, I'm not going to see this thing for three, four weeks. You know, whatever it is that you have. It's like that's the last thing anybody wants to do during duck season. But if you could just order replacement parts and get them in four or five days or whatever, at most a week, you're back running again. I think that's, like you said, that's a great, great thing right there you got going. Yeah, I appreciate that. And uh, I don't know. Everybody's got uh, different ideas on how careful to be with different equipment. I, I feel like we built this thing where you don't have to be extremely careful, but, uh, you know, we always have that one hunting partner or whoever who, uh, I don't know, in my particular case, my brother thinks it's hilarious to shoot a couple decoys before he leaves uh, <laughs> Colorado just to give me something to work on. But, uh, yeah, um, Brothers. you know, um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, uh, you know, like we get guys all the time who hunt out of the, the, the side by sides and, Somebody doesn't secure it to the back of the side by side, and next thing you know, you drag that thing for three miles, and your body's beat up, and you don't want to go home and repaint it. Buy mm-hmm. a new body, you know mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Mm. That's slick, yeah. <clears throat> Guys, you gotta go check them out. Check them out on the website and take a look at them. Go on Instagram too, and you're on Facebook as well. Yeah, we are. Um, okay. I'll, I'll confess to you, like I'm not religiously taking a look at our Facebook page. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'm not a huge social media guy. I kind of, uh, kind of tend to shy away from it, and I probably should be more into it than I actually am. But uh, like I said, my philosophy has always been: if we create something great here um, that, that is effective on ducks, uh, the rest will take care of itself. So it's true, though, because <clears throat> I use um, um like locked in for have been for quite a, quite a while is using JJ Lair's duck calls and just the way they are and stuff is like I won't even mess with anything else not I mean I kind of do just for the fun of it like cut downs or different things whatever I'm not opposed to it but I'll never leave the JJ Lair's duck calls and it's just part of how they're put together and stuff and <clears throat> I know the guy personally but uh he doesn't advertise at all, but he sells a lot of duck calls just because they, they speak for themselves and they sell all around the United States. So I, I totally yeah. get what you're saying. You make a good product <clears throat> and it sells itself. Um, so uh, as, <clears throat> as far as duck hunting goes, I'm just kind of curious, how did uh, last season go for you? You know, we had a good season. So Colorado is kind of interesting. Um, I would explain it this way. So I've got two young boys and uh, I can't travel like I used to be able to and I can't spend uh, an inordinate amount of time running around and chasing ducks. So I kind of have to wait to uh, wait till they come to me, so to speak. Um, And like I said, we've got that farm that's kind of my laboratory for 
checking out decoys and, and trying new stuff and, and filming and that kind of stuff. So uh, that farm's 45 minutes away from where I live. So it's tough for me to hop in a truck and then all of a sudden do a drive to Kansas and, and, and that kind of thing. So I, I hunt same spot a lot i can't really follow the ducks around so we're weather dependent here in colorado and it's all based on big pushes of weather and you know we had a uh, early season that was uh pretty mild but god once we got into november we just got these great pushes of ducks down and it was world class here uh all the way through january so wow. we were psyched about that yeah we were really psyched about that but uh mm. yeah you know there's some things that are just out of your control and you know, I've got a kid who plays hockey, so that's uh, that takes up half my time right there. So, um, um, you know, running up to the farm for, for a, a morning hunt uh, is possible and then making it home for a hockey game is possible. So I, I really don't uh, travel the way I used to, but uh, hopefully in the near future that changes. I mean, I, I think one of the best parts about duck hunting is uh, – the places it takes you and the people you meet along the way. So, um, but, uh, you know, it's a business for me, uh, in some ways that's kind of unfortunate, but, uh, we, we got to get out and hunt a lot and, uh, it's easier when I can just run up to, uh, my little, little meth lab on <laughs> small acreage and, yeah. uh, and hunt there. Yeah. Did you, so it sounds like you used to travel a lot, huh? Yeah, uh, you know, especially like before I was married and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was I was on the road all the time. I loved it. I loved that kind of lifestyle. And I loved living out of cheap motels and taking photos and taking video. And when I was working for the Division of Wildlife, we always had some projects going on in the field. I, I worked uh, kind of in the PR department there. I was chief of public affairs, so um, mm -hmm. I would figure out ways to sneak around the state and, and meet up with people that we worked with and. I really miss that, but, uh, you know, at this point, uh, kids have kind of become the priority and, yep. uh, I want them to be duck hunters too one day. So it's nice to be able to kind of swing them up there really quick for a quick hunt and, uh, not take them out of school and that kind of stuff. And, um, but there will be a day where I become a duck bum again and hopefully I can follow them all the way down from Saskatchewan, you know? Is that what you kind of used to do is just start all, literally all the way up in Canada and just work your way, follow the migration down? Oh, my God. I would love it. I would love it. Yeah. I would love the opportunity to do that. But uh, it's tough when you're running a business. And, yeah. Uh, um, you know, um, I just I just think uh, the thrill of hunting is, is kind of the places it takes you. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, there's nothing I would like to do more than go up and watch like minor league hockey in Saskatchewan at night and hunt ducks during the day. I think uh, <laughs> that sounds uh, almost utopic for me. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's funny because <clears throat> the longer I've duck hunted every year, I get more in love with it, basically, I guess for lack of a better term. And I think, like you said, I, I know now I can explain it. And it, part of it's, you know, it's just like you said, it's being with your family or your friends. You know, my daughter's, uh, my youngest, she's she's 11. She's really liking it. She shot her first ducks last year. She actually scotched double in a pair of teal and uh, with the 28 gauge. And I think nice. she, I think she's gonna want to go with me all the time. My other, my other older one, she's I think more, gonna be more into deer possibly, but. Um, it's just with the family, with the friends, your buddies experiencing those things together, seeing those insane sunrises, like the purple I've seen. I can't even, I've got so many pictures of insane sunrises and cause I, I mean, yeah, we all got piles of birds and pictures of that and that's cool and everything. And, and that just makes all that stuff better. But if you didn't have all those things to go with the pile of birds, I don't think it would be that special, you know? Yeah. And, you know, there's something to be said for public land hunting too. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, God, at the risk of offending a lot of hunters, uh, you know, you know, there's a ton of skill required to go to a public land spot that's pressured and, uh, do it right and be successful. And when you win that chess match, God, there's a feeling of accomplishment with that. In fact, I've got kind of a different philosophy when it comes to my boys. Like I make them beg me to take them hunting. Mm -hmm. Like I think like, uh, you know, that they, they kind of won the genetic lottery in terms of a hunting perspective where they can 
travel 45 minutes and have a pretty sweet duck hunt on yeah. their hands. But uh, at the same time, um, I want them to go through a phase where they're out there going from public land spot to public land spot and uh, all the adventures that come with that and all the people that you need on that front. I mean, that's what makes it spectacular. Yep. So I, I hope eventually to get back to that. I mean, I would love to just work my way down from Saskatchewan all the way through South Dakota and Montana. And it's some of the best part of this country. And it's, yep. uh, uh, I can't spend enough time there, you know, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Hold on one sec. Man, I've been fighting this. I actually, I'm pretty much over it now. But I had this cough for about two, actually three weeks. It catched me out of, off of off guard. Sorry about that. No, no, you're good. You're good. Yeah, I, I, uh, like you said, you're you're not wanting to offend anybody because I mean, there's a lot of people out there, especially here in California, that hunt clubs and <clears throat> private property and all that stuff, but. There's, I think, there's something to be said about, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Titus, but there's something to be said about hunting clubs, too. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in my position that wouldn't do any hunting if they if they couldn't go to some place right. that was convenient. And the camaraderie that's involved with the club and mm -hmm. the days working on it and all, all that kind of stuff. Uh, oh, man. There's something to be said for that. So if there's you a can ton get of a, work. Yeah. If you can get a good mix of both, I mean, that's the, that's the perfect situation. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, I guess that's one of the reasons why we hunt so much is because we're always looking for that uh, perfect textbook uh, kind of scenario or season. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, see, I, I went to um, Canada the one time that I waterfowl hunted in Canada. I've been there a few times for other things, but the time that I waterfowl hunted there in Canada, um, it was with a guy and everything. And, and it's cool, and it has its place. But, like, it did not do for me at all what it does when you're finding them yourself and you're having a hard time getting on them and been scouting a couple of days and trying different spots and it's just not going through. And then all of a sudden you hit that spot. And it's just the, all the work that goes behind it in public land is makes it the reward. It's not that it's not the reward's not good on private, but it's even better on public. You know, I guess that's how I would say it. I completely agree, um, and I also think it's it's an important thing to get humbled every once in a while as a hunter. Yeah. You just get your ass kicked by a trip mm -hmm. every once in a while but as a hunter. But uh, there's a little competitive side to me that loves coming out to a boat ramp or uh, you know coming out to a check station and having a bunch of ducks and seeing a bunch of guys – come up to you and ask you how'd you how'd you kill those yeah. <laughs> you know you know there's, that's, that's a flattering thing but yeah. uh i think as hunters too it's also important to see new things to try new things and learn from people and uh um like i said get your ass kicked in, in a trip every once in a while where you get a flat tire and uh the dog uh, isn't working right or whatever the case yep. may be but uh that's what that's what makes us better right? exactly that's that's the only way we learn if we just went, here's what I've seen, uh, f oh, something I, I'm a very deep thinker about stuff, and I watch a lot of people, and maybe I, oh, I think I do have a problem with overthinking things, but like, what I see with a lot of people is, <clears throat> especially newer hunters, if they go out there and say if they're doing everything wrong, I guess what we would say textbook wrong is, right? It may, it may work, but if, they, if they're successful <clears throat> in doing something that's normally not going to work <clears throat> and they're calling bad and, and they're not, and meaning it's not because they're new. It's just if they don't put the effort in to try to get better and learn, because that's my whole goal, right? Is always try to get better. And that's how I push other people. But if something works for someone like that, that's never really put in the effort and the work, then they think, Oh, it's easy. This is how this is. I can do this every time. I don't need to do all the stuff that you do. And I don't got to work hard like that. What, there, you're not learning nothing from that. But when you go out on that hunt and you did everything that you could possibly do and it still doesn't go right, well, you got to keep looking. You got to keep searching. You got to get better and you got to try harder and you got to hide better and you got to be willing to move more and keep your eyes peeled and see where maybe birds are working somewhere else. So it's just, it's just, 
you got to you got to stay humble and you got to stay willing to learn. It don't matter who you are and where you've been. You got to I always try to do my best to keep my ears open and learn from everybody such as people like yourself, you know. You could always pick something up. Yeah, let me let me ask you if, like I'm kind of fascinated with California. I, I mean, I met some guys in college that were in my fraternity and stuff that uh, were big hunters and they came from California and uh man, these guys could call like call to the point where you know you could be in the parking lot of a hunting spot and they, they would have a hen just hovering over their head while they're working the call and you know i grew up like i said my dad wasn't that into it so he never really learned to call i think we had like an old fox duck call, call in our uh in our boat and that he'd let us squawk on every once in a while and so you know i can i can turn the occasional duck now but uh to be perfectly honest i'm not the world's greatest caller on that front how critical is it to guys in california that that, that they learn how to call i mean i think it's very critical um i would say i'm just a mediocre i mean i i work on it and like two months before duck season i'm working on it hard and i've worked harder on my calling the last four years than I ever have, but I, I do. I think it's very critical. Um, I've seen, again, I'm kind of going back to some other things I've seen on YouTube and other things where people say, oh, you don't have to do this or you don't have to do that or I call with my 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 voice. or And I'm not to put that down. Uh, there, there's If it works, it works. But what I'm saying is like, I I just don't feel like you can do that here because, I mean, there's like a fine line between calling too much and not calling it enough, you know? And you literally have to be so cognizant of that all the time. It's like, when do you hammer down? And then when do you just very like subtle quacks? You know, I think it's important. Yeah. And I'll tell you this, when you're out of, when you're out of refuge, a public land refuge, there's definitely guys out there that can't call where to lick. And it's very obvious, but there is a lot of guys that can call really good, you know? Yeah. So. That's interesting to me. That's interesting to me. So, so I kind of view calling out here as, uh, I don't know, just a extra asset or an extra tool in your tool bag. But, uh, like I said, the wetlands that we hunt here are so small mm. and, uh, uh, you know, I'm kind of a less is more guy. Um, I'm a Drake whistle guy. Mm. I'm a finish the duck kind of guy. And then if, uh, you know, if these ducks are blowing away from you, then give them everything you got. But, uh, um, it's, it's interesting to hear how, you know, people from around the country treat calling. And I've seen some of these Southern guys that can turn a flock of ducks from, you know, across the lake. It's, it's, it's impressive to see. That's the truth. I was telling Thomas, we, we just went to the Delta Waterfowl Expo. I don't know if that's something you could ever get out to with your, and make, get a booth on next year. It's supposed to be in Baton Rouge. I would definitely tell you it would be well worth your time. Um, it's in, it's going to be July 26, 27, 28 next year. Um, I'm going to be going out there for sure again. It was really, really good. But, uh, man, I tell you what, you, you nailed it. Those Southern boys, I'll give them props. Those from the young to the old, those guys can blow duck calls. <laughs> Cause you were saying guys out in California could blow duck calls. I mean, there is a lot of guys that are good, <clears throat> but I feel like California is so vast and so many different types of things to do you know you got your group of duck hunters you got your group of surfers you got your group of you know uh, skiers and snowboarders you got people that like to rock climb i mean you got i feel like in arkansas it's kill deer or kill ducks like and i think there was so many people throughout the whole expo you could hear all around that place is just blown duck calls and it was not bad like you'll come out to california and you'll hear guys blown like, oh, that's rough. Like, <laughs> but, but you go, I, I never heard one person blown on a duck call. I believe I'm not exaggerating that I was like, man, they sound good on that thing. And, it, you know, most of them are cut downs, but I was just like, those guys can, those guys can blow a duck call. You know? Yeah. There's, there's nothing worse when you got a guy in your blind and, you know, because of the business I'm in every once in a while, you got to hunt with some new people and hunt with people that necessarily aren't your ideal person to hunt with mm -hmm. but, uh, there have been several times where i asked people to go back to the car and grab a box of shells and leave the call back <laughs> at the car yeah and that's hard to say because you don't want to offend people you know um but 
And that's what I was trying to say earlier is I know people that would kind of mock and say, it's not that you guys make a big deal about blowing a duck call. Could oh, oh, I'm not allowed to blow with you, you know, blow a duck call around you because blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, here's the thing. If I, if I go to a softball game, baseball game, if I'm playing basketball and I know there's a guy better than me, um, I respect that. And I try to respect that and do, you know, what that person says or play how that, play the position when it comes to duck hunting a lot of duck hunters people that can't do certain things they get super f- feelings hurt you know like oh, yeah. oh you're so good but it i mean you're either there you want to kill ducks or you don't i mean it's like kind of i've got a, i guess as i get older i get a little bit more vocal about that but i used to have a hard time saying anything because i was like oh, i don't want to say something you know but hurt someone's feelings but Yeah, I'm pretty frank about that kind of stuff, Um, you know, and I think there's an etiquette to it. When you invite somebody to go hunting with you, I I think you get you get to be the captain Mm -hmm. of the ship. And uh, um, uh, I think uh, that's the great thing about hunting is there is this like code or etiquette. I I hate the word code, but uh, there is this etiquette where it's somebody's jacking up your hunt man. you know, there's nothing worse uh, after you, because like I said, you get a finite number of days in the field a year and there's nothing worse. And hopefully that person is the kind of person that can take a hint and actually learn from it a little bit and maybe go and and work on something or or figure that out. But uh, there's nothing worse than being stuck next to somebody that's um, ruining your day. Yeah. hundred percent. Well, um, this has been a great conversation, Tyler. I really appreciate you coming on. I actually, I would like to have a follow up, possibly mid season to late season, um, and kind of share some experiences with you. With yeah, with I just, you bet. it's been a real pleasure, and uh, um, yeah, I'd be happy to do something like that. Uh, you guys have been great, and uh, it's always cool when you get to meet somebody in this industry that's. Uh, that's uh, easy to work with and and uh, a pleasure to work with. So, Titus, I can't thank you enough. Yeah, I appreciate that. Guys, go check out uh, duckcreekdecoys.com. You can look them up on their website, which is, I feel like, has got plenty of information, all the information you need, links to videos. You can go on their Instagram. You can check that out and uh, <clears throat> see, like, the videos, like the repair videos, if the, if needs be. You're very intuitive. Very awesome, great little videos, and you, you once you see that motion, trust me, you're definitely <laughs> you're gonna want to look more into it. Um, and I think the price is worth to be paid. So, thank you again, Tyler, for coming on this episode, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Awesome, Titus, thanks so much. Uh, flashbackdecoys.com, we really appreciate it. Thank you.